Okay. And now we started, so I'll pass the word to Lana just to say the welcoming and start our webinar. Super. Thank you so much, Bruno. And sorry for the technical difficulties. I think uh, we are we are used to these by now. So uh, welcome to the Edu for Europe webinar. Uh, this is the third webinar in our series of the forum. And uh, we had the first webinar one year after uh, the 2019 forum uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, so the first webinar was in November uh, with Brioni Hoskins. Uh, then we had the second webinar in April with uh, Professor Rosie Braidotti. And the third webinar in our series today is with uh, Marta Medlinska, uh, who is from the Council of Europe Education Department, and she will be talking to us about the competences for democratic culture and how these relate to citizenship education. So I pass forward back to Bruno uh, to introduce Marta, and uh, I look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Lana. And hopefully this uh, series of events will take us to a, a presential moment hopefully uh, soon next year where we'll be able to discuss all of these topics and we'll go deeper and see other practice and, and above all to, to explore the role of uh, European democratic citizenship in Europe nowadays. Uh, but to also to, to give us some food for thought, we have uh, a guest speaker, Marta Medlensky. Um, I'm going briefly to read uh, um, a short bio of Marta. I'm sure that, um, that she can also add a couple of things. Uh, Marta, she was involved in the youth field since 98 till 2020, 2020. Um, she was dealing with youth work, youth research and youth policy, firstly in Warsaw when she was working on more connected with the national agencies and the youth program, but then uh, until very recently, then last year in Strasbourg where she was coordinating the partnership between the European uh, Commission and the Council of Europe in the youth field, uh, addressing issues on the social inclusion, the participation of young people, youth work, policy and research. Marta is currently now working on the Council of Europe in the uh, education department. Um, that is also the department that was responsible uh, for the reference framework of competence for the immortal culture. Um, and it's uh, basically the flagship initiative um, that is running since 2016. So Marta, thank you for joining us and also to present us more about the, um, the framework and also about this butterfly effect. What does it uh, mean in this context? Thank you very much for joining us, Marta. Hello. Um, my pleasure. It really feels like uh, coming back home. <laughs> Indeed, uh, it's not been uh, but a few months uh, since I, I uh, moved on to other life paths. And actually, um, right now, I'm trying to explore the paths in between the formal, non-formal and informal education. And it's very exciting. I thought that uh, maybe today, uh, as the weather, at least here in Strasbourg, is beautiful and, uh, and I had a wonderful weekend running after the butterflies, I could talk also about those, not only about the formal things related to education. So let me, let me try and combine the two things. Hopefully it will then be, uh, it will have more wings. Let, let me tell uh, you if I can share my screen. First of all, mm, almost there. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think it's always a pleasure to know that uh, you continue with one step on one leg on each side, huh? because I think the youth field will continue to, to count on you and, and, and we'll be always very happy to have you close. Now, I think now we can see the, the screen sharing. Just to confirm, Marta, if you are still listening. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? She is already on. So, first of all, about um, the framework. So, geographically speaking, we are looking at quite a big part of the, of the world. I decided not to take it for granted that everybody uh, knows how big the Council of Europe uh, is in terms terms of geographical scope. So um, yes, here is the, the map. And here we go to the um, topic of 
today's webinar. The butterfly effect and what it has to do with the reference framework of competences for democratic culture. Let me start first with the, um, with the nice uh, greeny and wingy part. So I think uh, there are not very many people who wouldn't like butterflies um, and they come in all shapes, um, um, colors, uh, sizes and so on. They live on all the continents except for Antarctica maybe. And um, I was very glad to run after some of them. Saturday and Sunday. Um, they are funny creatures because they actually um, come from caterpillars. But I'm sure you know, because usually this is uh, informal, at least education and exercise done with children. Uh, those caterpillars need to eat a lot, sleep a lot, and then they become beautiful butterflies. A friend of mine says that it's actually exactly the opposite than human beings that we could see now with the um, confinement. But anyway, let's now talk uh, about the caterpillars for too long. Uh, I wanted to show you this one. It's a photo uh, from National Geographic from 2014. It's beautiful and uh, very well done, not like mine. What is interesting about it is that it's also a very adaptable animal. Uh, this species, uh, I will not uh, risk pronouncing it or mispronouncing its name, uh, was bred to turn purple in four months only. I think that this is very uh, impressive. I heard the story of butterflies that used to be white because they were sitting on birch trees. And during the Industrial Revolution in, in England, um, when the smoke caused that also the birch trees became much uh, darker, the butterflies became darker with them. I thought it was very exciting. And now they are, uh, I also discovered that there are other um, species of butterflies that are capable of changing quite swiftly. So you need to be smart to do that. I will not go into details of explaining how. I encourage you to look into National Geographic if, if it's of your interest. And um, here a flying butterfly. I can tell you it wasn't easy to, to take the photo. It's a little bit blurry, sorry about that. But in the middle, you can see the yellow butterfly flying. And uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful to see. Um, and why we are talking about the butterflies uh, is because of Edward Lawrence, a mathematician and meteorologist who um, explored um, part of the, the, the chaos theory. He realized that tornado could be influenced by minor perturbations such as distant butterfly flapping its wings several weeks earlier. I'm sure that many of you have at least heard of butterfly effect. Well, maybe butterfly wings cannot cause a tornado, but it, they, can, they can actually influence it at least slightly. And that's the whole idea. A very small change in initial conditions creates a significantly different outcome. And here is where I thought I would stop talking about butterflies so much and ask, um, my colleagues to share with you the um, movie, a short movie about other butterfly that I wanted to talk about. I'm on it and I'm sharing the video right now. Here it comes. In a democratic and culturally diverse society, for citizens to exercise their rights and responsibilities in an effective and appropriate way, they need specific competences. These competences, which encompass values, attitudes, skills, and knowledge and critical understanding, are the core of the referent framework of competences for democratic culture, developed by the Council of Europe. These competences are necessary in various types of situations, such as considering information and understanding local, national, European or global issues, making informed decisions during elections, 
cooperating with others to solve concrete issues in diverse contexts, engaging in civil action or volunteering, resisting propaganda and manipulation and taking a stance against hate speech. The reference framework of competences for democratic culture provides not just a description of these competences, but also a set of principles, descriptors of competences and guidelines on how educators can contribute to the development of these competences among citizens of all ages. And here we are, back to Marta, please. I suppose that you could already get a bit of an idea why I was talking about the butterflies before, even if you hadn't had a look at the reference framework of competences for democratic culture before. Um, but let me then talk a bit about this, one of the flagship initiatives of the education uh, department in the recent years, a bit more. And here I will go back to hopefully sharing my screen. Voila, here is the official title that you can see it in brief, it's simply RFCDC and I will be using mostly that abbreviation. Um, the whole uh, story started in 2013 and it was um, an initiative of Andorran chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. Um, it was from the start a very ambitious education project. It enjoyed very strong political support throughout, as you can imagine, not least because of the context that included terrorist attacks in different countries in Europe. And the uh, framework was adopted in 2016 by ministers of education in Europe. And is meant uh, um, to be a comprehensive, single comprehensive framework that covers citizenship education, human rights education and intercultural education, quite a mixture, I would say, not small a challenge. Um, and it is based on the principles and helps realizing the principles of, of the Charter on Education for Democratic Citizenship and Human Rights Education um, of the Council of Europe, as well as the organization's call for quality education. And um, it looks at the competences uh, and transparent, coherent, comprehensive description of, of those, and those that are required for active democratic participation. It is meant mostly, at least as it was developed, to cover uh, formal education. And I will tell you more about it, but it absolutely has huge potential for covering all forms of education, including youth work. And um, why so? Because it is uh, full of proposals of how to equip children, young people with those competences needed for uh, participating actively in democratic culture, um, respecting, promoting, defending human rights and participating in effective and appropriate intercultural dialogue. One can, of course, ask what is appropriate intercultural dialogue, but uh, well, we will not dwell on that uh, today very much, just a little bit. Um, the reference framework is based on two assumptions. On the one hand side, it looks at and promotes democratic culture that is basically crucial for making democracy work, because the fact that they are democratic processes and institutions doesn't guarantee that uh, we can have democracy. It's also the attitude, the values, 
um, and all the other competencies that young and other people need to display to actually make it function. So it requires citizens to have commitment to um, those democratic processes, to sharing their opinions with decision makers, actually telling and caring, but also listening to the opinions of others, um, knowing that democracy is also about respecting uh, what majorities uh, prefer, but with respecting also the rights of minorities and resolving conflicts peacefully. And the other leg, if you want, uh, could be um, about intercultural dialogue. Because in our increasingly intercultural societies, of course, it is, it is vital, this dimension, to make sure that the democratic discussion and debate can happen peacefully, efficiently, and effectively. And it's about enabling all citizens to contribute to political decision making on an equal basis and irrespective of their specific cultural affiliations. By 2018, there were already these three volumes. The first one about the context, concepts, and model of the RFCDC. The second one about the descriptors. And finally, the third volume on the implementation guidelines. And let me just say a few words maybe about um, these three volumes. So the first one is about the competences. And they are 20. You probably didn't quite have time to count during the, the video, but they are 20, all are teachable, learnable, accessible. And so I think it's also quite um, useful as, as a concept, as a, um, as a model that can be used in educational um, contexts. But of course, there were more. There were selected some 55 competences, uh, identified across 101 competence schemes. So it was quite an exercise. Um, and the whole idea is that, of course, these competences do not um, exist or do not um, are not applied in reality on, on their own or relatively re rarely. It's about the clusters of competences. So competent individual mobilizes and deploys clusters of competences in fluid, dynamic, and adaptive manner in order to meet the constantly shifting demands, challenges, and opportunities opportunities that arise in democratic and intercultural situations, as you can read in one of those volumes. So basically, we, we wouldn't so easily think of specific one competence uh, while doing things, so in action. But in educational pedagogical processes, that aspect might be more interesting. And here is exactly where the butterfly comes. So as you can see, um, unlike very many of competence schemes that exist, um, competences are not only understood as skills, knowledge and critical understanding and attitudes, but also values. That's why all those four, four wings are important. You can imagine hardly a butterfly uh, uh, flying without one of them. Um, and um, they are grouped. Um, as you as you can see here, uh, values in three different um, groupings, and then there are more six attitudes and eight groups of skills, um, and three core areas of knowledge and critical understanding. That is very interesting because it's about knowledge and critical understanding of the self coming first, and sometimes we forget about it. Then about the critical understanding of language and communication. So how do we mediate between ourselves and the outer world, other people? And then the knowledge and critical understanding of the world, of politics, law, human rights, culture, religions, and so on and so forth, including environment and sustainability, which of course I linked to economy. So I'm sure you can see a lot of things on which all of you have had a chance to work um, either as, as participants of activities or trainers or youth workers, animators, whichever um, role you play in relation to citizenship education. And I'm sure that many of them would be dear to you. Of course, one can probably uh, discuss uh, how to formulate which is grouped with what, but I can just tell you that it has been given a lot of thought and um, piloted with um, thousands and thousands of people across Europe. Um, 
and it still in a way stands. So at least it's a good uh, starting point for discussion about these issues. Now about the second part, which go more in depth about the descriptors. So the second volume. Um, they are meant to help operationalize the competences. And um, they are basically about what person a person is able to do. Um, and we know it very well from the youth field as uh, the learning outcomes, but of course they also uh, learning outcomes exist perhaps increasingly in the, in the edu formal education field. That's trying to put it really simply. There, were, there are over uh, 130 key descriptors, 135, and they were selected from almost 450 scaled or other descriptors, and all are scaled into basic, intermediate, and advanced levels of proficiency. What is interesting is that this proficiency uh, evolves in time, but it does not necessarily always increase. What is interesting is that sometimes the circumstances, the conditions um, might mean that also there is a stepping back in the competences understood as also attitude values, knowledge and critical understanding and skills. So it's not to be taken for granted that, uh, that those uh, competences are once achieved and then once for all it's done. The descriptors are used as reference points for curriculum development, uh, for design, implementation, and evaluation of learning activities, as well as for the assessment. In the youth field, it would rather be the self-assessment part of it and as aid for critical reflection on learning. So it can very well be used also, they can very well be used as, um, as in a portfolio, for instance, where people can also share peer feedback or, or where they can reflect uh, themselves on uh, their advancement in relation to different competences. And let me maybe share just uh, examples of those descriptors for one of the very many topics that, uh, that we have seen listed there. Uh, so basic level of proficiency in civic mindedness, civic mindedness. Um, the basic level would be uh, expresses willingness to cooperate and work with others and collaborate with other people for common interest causes. I would say that uh, uh, the basic level is already quite demanding, <laughs> but then uh, if we look at the intermediate level of proficiency, uh, you can look at expresses commitment to not being a bystander when dignity and rights of others are violated, as an example. So I actually want to take action when I see something that, uh, that I do not agree with and that uh, infringes on the rights of others. And discusses what can be done to help make the community a better place. Um, so it's, it's already a very active role. Um, that is seen as this intermediate level of proficiency. And on advanced, uh, also, it's just an example, exercises the obligations and responsibility of, uh, responsibilities of active citizenship at either local, national, or global level. Of course, it starts already at the basic level, I would say, but um, if one wants to do it full-fledged, it's considered advanced and takes action to stay informed about civic issues. I was wondering, for instance, if takes action to stay informed is, uh, is uh, um, less, uh, is more advanced than taking action to actually do things. Um, but basically what, what I'm trying to say is that the civic mindedness and then try is broken down to things that people are able to do. And I could imagine myself planning an educational activity that focuses on some of those statements of what is the expected outcome, learning outcome for the people with whom we would be running jointly such an activity. So I invite you to, to look into that and, and uh, see yourself if you can find some of those uh, descriptors, even if there are so many. I can, as, as you can see on the example, and I can tell you they, they seem to be maybe over 
um, uh, overwhelming with their number and the how how um, deep and the extensive the process of coming and from coming to them and formulating them was but in the end they are quite straightforward so nothing to fear about and i'm sure that in the youth field plenty of these things are regularly worked on anyway and then about the last volume so implementation guidelines and the implementation guidelines are mostly really for people related to the formal education, um, policymakers, teachers and head teachers, uh, different education leaders like deans at universities, for instance, um, curriculum developers at authorities, different levels again. But as I mentioned, I'm sure that it can very well work for other educators too. And to put it very, very plainly, curriculum is basically understood as a plan for learning. Pedagogy as a way of organizing the learning process. That is, to give you an example, cooperative learning or project-based learning. That's again, things that, uh, that is the daily bread for many of you, I'm sure. And then there is the dimension of assessment, which of course uh, exists in formal education, um, rather than in the non-formal um, side of it. But if it is understood as a means of empowering learning learners and understanding where one stands and where, for instance, some further development could be of advantage, then I think it can also be an interesting approach to consider. Um, the last dimension of it that I thought was worth um, stressing was the whole school approach. So um, it's not only a subject in different lessons. It's not only um, a dimension happening within one class, but ideally the democratic principles should be extended to all the dimension of school life. So whole school approach for the school management, participation in taking decisions, what is happening in the school, and so on. There is, for instance, a democratic schools network, uh, so network of schools that fulfill um, and commit to different values related to this, to the competences for democratic culture. And they um, attempt to do it to the best of their capacities. Um, same for the universities. And this is an increasing trend. I would say that it's even easier in, in, for instance, youth organizations or uh, um, other structures in which you might be involved in and where, where people are perhaps even more used to living this practice of deciding together, co-creating things together and, and living together. And I I would not like to extend too much to leave question uh, time for questions too, if there are any. Um, why I was talking about all this, it's not because it's the, the flagship initiative of the Council of Europe, it's I think because it's so much needed. In the 2021 report of the Secretary General of uh, the Council of Europe, and that has uh, such a wonderful and uh, green and blue uh, cover, um, you can find a picture of the state of democracy, human rights and the rule of law, and the title is Democratic Renewal for Europe. Um, and it's very good that it's so uh, looking forward and, and positive, but the picture right now is not necessarily uh, so, so sunny. Uh, we could see, not least because of the pandemics, uh, the situation of um, sliding really back with different gains that uh, took years to be to be developed to, to be reached in many of the states across the world including the council of europe member states so the whole idea is that um, we need to continue doing what we can to promote democracy human rights and the rule of law because they can never be taken for granted and here it comes also the um, more explicit <laughs> statement of, of, uh, of, of links to, to butterflies. On the one hand side, we need to, to adapt. Um, and this adaptability 
variety, for instance, of this of this butterfly to the different contexts. The butterflies are able to do that. I'm sure that we can also adapt this butterfly to our different needs, possibilities, contexts, and and use it to 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 the advantage basically of of um, the learners and their communities. Of course, it takes time. You could see also the photo of the caterpillar uh, that uh, doesn't become a butterfly uh, overnight. Uh, it takes uh, days and weeks to actually uh, for the to happen um, and uh, requires uh, quite a lot of resources and I think that citizenship education, democratic citizenship education is also such a process of, of taking step at a time and then going ahead and sometimes maybe also taking step back. And then the, the butterfly effect um, that was saying that a small change in the initial conditions can make a big difference towards the end, to the end result, is exactly our, our belief and our hope that if we all flap wings <laughs> together to make positive changes in the lives of children, young people, ourselves, young adults, other adults, as you he heard in the, in the video, it's really meant for, for everyone, then maybe <laughs> the... Um, um, this sky will be will be so so blue over the democratic uh, democratic Europe um, or bluer, which <laughs> a word that doesn't exist in English, and and the grass greener, then uh, then we sometimes uh, might be seeing um, right now in some places, and uh, this is also very close to the way of uh, perceiving it uh, by the youth sector that we need to build it together um, the world in which uh, we want to live in not least for for the for the young people and and children and this adaptability and this potential um, are being explored here in the house in the council of europe but there are also very interesting initiatives outside um, that are worth exploring further, that are worth looking at, that can be interesting and inspiration, or maybe you have ideas that you would like to, to bring forward and, and take up uh, in your work on citizenship education. And please do let us know if that's the case, uh, because we will be soon looking at the examples of how this is happening in different contexts, not only in formal education contexts. Um, starting with uh, vocational education and training, but afterward also non-formal education. So I look forward to, to keeping in, in touch uh, for, for this exchange uh, to, to maybe not cause a tornado, but, uh, but maybe positively influence uh, the weather forecast, uh, at least in Europe, if not wider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta, um, also for sharing this um very interesting and very important resource, especially in the times that we are living now in Europe and not only in Europe, um, something that can also help in terms of um, fostering participation, fostering citizenship, and, and, and above all, improving the quality of our democracy that I think is, is a big topic nowadays and, uh, and we need a lot of butterflies, let's say. Um, but before, um, just to, to pass the word again to you, Marta, just to see if there is any question from the audience, from the, the colleagues that are also here in the panel. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try to provoke the, the, the audience first, if there is, can use always the Q&A or the chat, um, if there is um, a particular question or, or even a comment, you can share here. Otherwise, also, we encourage you to use also the Facebook on the different channels that this is being broadcast. Also, we're going to give a look. But now I would pass, I think, Lana and Federica, they have a question. I see some yes. Um, so maybe we can start with, with Lana that has the mic on already. Then I'll pass to Federica. Sorry, thank you for that. Uh, sorry, mine is more of a reflection and uh, I was kicked out uh, for a few moments. I apologize for that uh, from the Zoom. Uh, but I think for me, this uh, note that these competences are actually something that can be learned is really important takeaway for Edu for Europe and for our project. And uh, especially as we're uh, now 
starting a research on uh, citizenship education and its impact on young people's participation in democratic societies. So the connections with these uh, competences and, and what can be learned and how is going to be really important in uh, understanding uh, how young people can be encouraged to, uh, to take part uh, in a society, in democracies, and uh, kind of to have their voices heard and also demand, uh, demand uh, their priorities and needs uh, be understood and uh, reacted upon uh, by policymakers. So, for me, this is probably the, the main uh, takeaway uh, for now. Thank you, Lana. So um, I'll pass already to Marta and then we'll go for the second question. I think will be easier. Thank you. No, I, I absolutely agree. And uh, as, as mentioned, uh, even if uh, uh, there is a level of complexity uh, involved uh, in the world and in the, the reference framework uh, that um, maybe might be increasingly difficult even for, for more um, used to dealing with this topic adults, not all probably are. Um, certainly what, uh, what can be stressed is, is the possibility to, 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 to learn, to develop. Uh, what I like a lot about this uh, reference framework of competencies for democratic culture is that actually learning by doing is so much, uh, so much stressed. And that's the process that is not obvious in many uh, cases to organize informal education and, and uh, is so natural and organic in the, in the youth field. Um, you talk the talk, you walk the walk. It is easy to, to declare that, uh, that um, it should be every, the process it should be democratic, but, but uh, is uh, everybody given a chance to, to, to say uh, what they would like? Uh, is everybody given a share in, in shaping uh, the environment and, and often their own life? Sometimes it's not the case. They are always groups, uh, people who are in more vulnerable situations. Um, that, that need to be um, encouraged and, and helped perhaps, or not, not helped, walked together with, I would rather say. Um, and yes, lear learning by doing, I think would be, <laughs> would be the, the main point. It's, it's the, the only way to, to get to this life skill. The hands on the job. Thank you. Um, and I'll pass to Federica that also has a question or a comment also to share with us. Yeah, I was uh, having more uh, question curiosity uh, and just think about exactly learning by doing. Uh, if I understood well, in a, if I'm, I remind well, because we also presented the part of this uh, uh, framework during the, the first edition of the forum that we did in Strasbourg. And there was a moment a call no, for project for pilot phase uh, activities or projects at those phase. So I was curious to know if you had some element to share with us uh, about the outcome of this pilot uh, phase, if you got some example of project that has been run, just to have a little bit of taste from how this uh, framework has been used and I think translated and adapted to the different rea reality that you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for the question. Um, there was indeed a, a call for, for projects and several were implemented. Unfortunately, with the pandemics, the possibilities of, of uh, continuing this initiative were a bit limited. But it was really a heartwarming what, what happened, at least at some of those projects. Of course, I would not have an exhaustive uh, understanding of, of all of them. Um, but just to give a few examples, um, there was a, a project really happening on the level of, of, the, of the school, because it can happen from the ministry level, so the policymakers on the national level, to the regional and local authorities, to individual schools or organizations that, that, that decide to, to take it up uh, in their activities or, or individual teachers that, that wish to look at whatever they do from the point of view of, of strengthening those competences. Uh, so some of the examples of the projects uh, were, for instance, um, the school community um, produce their own butterflies so that they would 
discuss about the different competences, try to make it make the, the whole concept their, their own and produce the big butterfly that is uh, since the project uh, at the entrance of, of the school, reminding everybody of the spirit of, of uh, democratic culture. Um, and it's changed a bit the way uh, in which the school uh, functions. So it's it's more into dialogue, more into debate. Um, the competences have been incorporated um, in some of the um, subject matters. And um, another project was related to uh, um, initiative of young people that were protecting the, the environment and uh, in, in their local community and the basis uh, for them and, and support they received were from the, from the school. And uh, the project was then granted uh, some, some awards in, in on, also on, on European level. Um, and it wasn't, of course, because of the RFCDC, it was because of the young people that, that were bringing in their, their, in their beliefs and their, their values, their energies, they wanted to do something. And the role of the teacher, a bit like would be of a youth worker or, or, or a non-formal educator would be just to, to help them in, in this seeing, to, to structure it may be a little bit uh, give indications where to look for more information and and all this was was then done together um, you can find more information about it um, on the website i can then uh, provide later maybe the, the link to it um, democratic schools network by the way the network is is being continuously enlarged so if you know of of projects that uh, that would be um, interesting and, and and relevant for for this topic it might be possible also for for such a school to join there is not yet a, a network of of universities of non-governmental organizations who do that <laughs> but um, certainly a lot of um, approaches methods ideas can be still further exchanged the the, the borders between formal non-formal and informal are much more fluid than there were some some years ago i would say and the inspiration might might still be shared um, this network is actually um, resulted from from the work on the rfcdc thank you very much lana for sharing the <laughs> the link mm -hmm. we have also here um a comment in the format of a question, I would say, but um, I'll try here to formulate the question. Um, so basically, Anna, one of our, our attendees is asking, uh, I think we should create an alliance to foster democratic culture through cooperation of local and European institutions, schools, youth work, active young people, and non-organized uh, young people. And do you have any suggestions or reflections on this, about this importance to create this alliance uh, uh, between these different sectors? Um, I think you're just referring about networks that are focusing quite sectorial, maybe this uh, more cross-sectorial approach within this topic, how it's being fostered and how we are blurring even more these boundaries between the sectors. Uh, a very, very good, very good comment. I would like such an alliance uh, to exist indeed uh, too. For now, they exist mostly on, uh, on um, um, local level <laughs> where there are cooperation projects uh, on ongoing basis. So not a short term project, but really a way of, of, of uh, running activities that, uh, that involve local communities, schools, uh, NGOs sometimes businesses too and certainly local authorities uh, that that are related to those uh, to those competences and some of those practices as on the website that that you could see uh, can can be found there there is also a publication that looks at um, such cooperation projects um, using already rfcdc non-formal education in um, um, the work of uh, there which is um, a network that looks at, at exactly that is at the core of, 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 of this work. And they looked specifically on the cooperation, on the peer learning that might be happening, on the examples of projects that, that use um, uh, RFCDC. I think that we are slowly getting there. The, the critical mass is probably, I hope, I, I wish to, and, and I dare to, to believe, uh, increasing. Um, 
and also that network is, is an example of cooperation among the educators for, for this specific topic. Um, yeah, why not uh, talk about creating such a platform and such, a, such an alliance? <laughs> nowadays would be would be more needed than ever i would say um but again challenging challenging definitely challenging um but i think it's we need also this diversity of approaches as, as marta was referring that i think many practices that will be shared and, and build on this topic um there's no question still on the facebook i don't know if one of the colleagues still have um, another question popping up Yes, I see Marta, uh, Marta Lena saying yes. Um, for me, it's a, it's a bit of a question and a bit of a kind of reflection for all of us uh, regarding uh, the competences and what it takes uh, to actually encourage and support and promote uh, democratic societies. Uh, uh, on the one hand, we have the competences that are promoted through formal education, through schools, uh, then we also have uh, a lot of a lot of work done through non-formal education. So the youth workers and young people are involved quite a bit. Um, but then there is also a question of other stakeholders uh, within a democratic society, uh, which also need to play their part. Um, so I wonder if we need the kind of the competences uh, for democratic culture for the whole society, uh, and uh, also the different levels of authorities, the private sector, uh, maybe also for parents um, and. Uh, yeah, so this would be more kind of a reflection and uh, pondering uh, what it takes. I don't know if you wish to comment, Marta, or if other colleagues want to add. Yeah, I would gladly, uh, gladly, uh, in a way, add. <laughs> not sure if comment, but uh, to, to add to that. Uh, to an extent, the, well, first of all, the competences are not the end in, in itself. It's just a means to then be able to, to shape the, the, the world uh, uh, around. And I absolutely agree that we are educating children and young people. Uh, and sometimes it's not, uh, it's not only in their hands or it's not in their hands and they need to be with others. So that's why uh, the um, RFCDC is also addressed to the policymakers. So the attempt is to try to also make the educators, teachers, for instance, and, and then also the educational authorities understand more the possible role that they might play, the importance of, of, of that role, and to engage the communities and, and families at least. So this whole school approach that I was talking about uh, includes the whole school uh, management, uh, parents and local communities as well. Uh, there is increasing discussion about the role of school as a, as a center for a lot of community happenings. So um, because of availability of place, because of um, where, where everybody, the place where everybody gathers uh, regularly and discusses anyway, I don't know, for instance, waiting for children coming out of, of school, um, but also for, for the question of indeed bringing in these new ideas, but extending beyond the children and young people also to the larger community. And I hope that this uh, whole institution or whole school approach can be can be uh, enlarged uh, indeed. And why I stressed in the beginning of the presentation that there was a strong political uh, support, because it was adopted by the ministers, the, the RFCDC was adopted on by, by the ministers on, on then uh, more or less European level, quite the highest possible for, for this topic level. And it enjoyed some visibility uh, at the time of adoption. Unfortunately, the, the tragic events related to, to, to terrorism uh, in recent years um, brought it even more to the fore because it was the time when uh, when everybody was saying yes we need to to work on this on this topic i just hope that this hype uh, uh, sad but um, but effective uh, in a way doesn't go away and then everything everything comes down and uh, only now and then from from an attack to another might be re renewed because we really need this effort continuously that's something that should be built in in our societies 
and uh, of course it will not happen overnight but uh, but i hope that uh, also i i believe in capacity of children and young people also to educate the others little by little and by working together and just one more uh, one more um during the times of the pandemic my colleagues who are working on um digital citizenship education, which is another topic I think very relevant for, for the series and, and, and for the topic that we are addressing now. Um, there was a huge interest of parents for obvious reasons, because schools were closed. Uh, they were those that were supporting children, young people in their, in their learning. And I think many people realized in that time that perhaps they need to continue that involvement and also beyond the time of the pandemics. It would be really excellent to keep on this engagement, to, to build it together more. And then it's education, not only for the children and young people, it's really this whole community approach. Thank you, Marcus. I think something you just proposed, something that I think should have almost a, a working group or, or, or a team on itself in terms of the forum to explore this digital citizenship. And, uh, and the role that is having had during the pandemic is having and will have in the future. Maybe we go for a last question um, before we start closing. Federico, you still have a question? Yeah, and a question and uh, again a curiosity because I think this is also good in this discussion that we are putting together, as you said, Marta, before, no? the, the approach that has been developed for the formal sector, and then I'm, I'm more reflecting from the youth sector and maybe for the non-formal. Uh, part, no, because you said that, that this uh, approach has been uh, launched with a big institutional support. So I think this was also big visibility, not so big a uh, political push, no, because the social and the political uh, situation was also asking uh, to, 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 to stay in, to, to stand for a certain kind of approaches. Then I had to mind a question about. Um, challenges to implement this approach nowadays, no? Because we know always very well that when uh, the spotlight uh, goes to an an another point, no? Uh, as other uh, priority comes, then we had a good material, we had good approaches, but then also challenges to create sustainability, for example, no? Um, so my question was a little bit, if you can, uh, share with us possible challenges to implement this, this approach that you have faced already or that you see in, in the scene? A very comprehensive and important question. Thank you, Federica. <laughs> um, I absolutely agree um, that it's um, not easy to implement it. Uh, and there are several reasons for, for that and also for the sustainability of this and of this political will sustainability also uh, of the real um, dimension of also the, the political declaration that it's important. How does it translate into specific actions and funding and support for, for the activities related to citizenship education? I was sorry to learn that um, as in, in some countries, basically, the, the, even the funding for this kind of activities for awards not increasing on the contrary, while we see what is what is happening. And I think it's telling in itself um, so that the political support is not necessarily there uh, across the board and it is not necessarily sustainable. That's also how democracy works. They, they are ups and, and downs and you know it, it changes. That's why I think that the steady work as much as possible, steady work of educators uh, is important. I think that it's key to have the teachers and other educators, including youth workers, um, encountering at least this concept of competences for democratic uh, culture, um, explaining why uh, they are important and how this can be in very simple ways uh, done. And here we get to, to another point, which is, uh, it's very idealistic. It's very idealistic. I would I would love to say that I have the advanced level in all the different competences for all the different descriptors, and I know very well that it's not the case. And I look around and I can tell exactly the same. So I think that it's easy to um, get lost in the complexity and the level of challenge 
but we should not be we should not be discouraged even even in small small bits it's like this butterfly you know uh, flapping its, its wings and causing some some change uh, on the, on a longer run i think that it's even if we manage to to in, do some some small steps everybody at their own scale there will already be a difference and um the difficulty of course is is doing it in other in times of adversity that uh, some of us might be experiencing in different ways because of the strain not having time because of lack of finance because of lack of political support because of lack of will on the political level or, or other there are plenty of, of, of challenges of, of this kind uh, and even here in the um, in in the Council of Europe, I see also that sometimes this habit of, of working in um, sectors does not always help because in the in the way I think that the, the actions can really beautifully be done together and they are compatible. Uh, so I think we need to to um, explore this compatibility and and strengths and and um, find ways of doing it a very simple and straightforward manner despite the complexity of the of the whole uh, concept if i can if i made last comment then i shut up i promise you I, no but i think because this complexity that was bringing my mind the bell how much is important for example to bridge together the formal sector so the schools what I had in mind now and the youth work no i was assisting a conference of uh, about to peace a resolution a couple of weeks ago and there was this professor of um, british university that was speaking about this uh, responsible education no that sounds very nice no that the kids should learn how to be responsible how to take decision and so on but then she was showing a graph and showing how much time this responsible education could be run in the curricula that is very small how much time they pass at school that is big but still is not so big and then how much time they have outside school and for her, the question was how we can really speak about responsible education if this doesn't became part of the everyday moment of life for the kids, you know, that is connected what you were saying, for example, in the model about values. You no, know? for me, this is a core question. You no, know? when if you want to change, then we have to think about how this uh, could have an impact on the values. So I think in this sense for me, this breach with uh, youth work uh, could also be in. Uh, uh, bringing more powerful uh, approach you know, to the to the society in this way, also to being able to have an, we say, an holistic approach uh, to, to the model. Thank you. I I cannot agree more, and that's that's why this this whole system approach uh, is is very for, for me very telling. Uh, it's uh, systemic. Uh, approach that well while keeping it simple and of course we are not necessarily of having speaking of another I don't know how many uh, additional lessons or activities in, in youth work it's very much in the way of doing things as well so if if we are to be to be uh, convincing uh, I think we also need to really believe it and, and, and live it and and then it becomes naturally part of i don't know maths uh, mathematics uh, ma mathematics physics i don't know biology it can be done in a way that uh, conveys these values and there are very nice examples that you can find both in the three volumes that i was talking about and, and on the website from from the schools and i'm sure that there are plenty of other examples uh, that are that are um, illustrating that um again you know talk, talk the walk and, and and walk the walk i realized that during the pandemics uh, the role of school um not only for the academic achievement but also for um the social role of school was seen more again and uh, i thought it was it was lacking uh, very much in many many schools and now there are countries that recommend uh, limiting the amount of curriculum elements to be put on the agenda for, for, for students of different ages, to leave space for the social fabric 
creation for the for the social dimension in schools. People realized with the pandemics, with the with sitting at home, everybody in front of their screens, uh, that that's really very important, not less important than all the other subjects that, that schools are treating. And of course, that's precisely also what is happening in the youth sector. So even if, if this is happening, even in the formal education, that's what I'm trying to do, then, then uh, I think we are, we are going perhaps in the, in the right direction of seeing that, that we can learn living together by living together in according to the principles that, uh, that we believe are the right ones. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, uh, Lana, Federica, and also Kelly for supporting also in the technical side. Um, we'll continue our series of webinars um, on the, our path to the, um, to the forum, to the presidential forum, where these topics and the, 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 also the resources and the importance to make bridges between sectors, but also what Marta was sharing about, there is a lot of resources, there's materials out there, it's a matter of also, exploring them and, and then trying to see how they work in practice but um, also new topics that become quite relevant nowadays um, as digital citizenship among others will be able to explore it and discuss it and see uh, how can we continue walking the talk or talking the walk uh, i'm always good in these proverbs um, thank you martha very much for being available and to sharing with us and hopefully for making also this bridge between our formal and then formal youth work in all, all the sectors, because definitely it's not something for a, a sector to be able to deal a lot alone. Thank you very much for the invitation and time. Thank you. And thank you to all.